Right, so we are rolling the sound and camera. Good afternoon, Alan. Thank you very much for this, um, this interview. Um, yeah, if you could just start. Are you going to be asking the questions, or? Yes, I will be, but um, I will be asking all the questions. Okay, I'll right. make that nice and loud. Okay. Sure. Um, so you you would first like me to just tell Indeed. you something about. I was born in Assam, in on the borders of Burma and India, in 1941, in the day that the Japanese invaded Singapore. And my father later was a tea planter, and so I have quite strong roots in the eastern Himalayas. I went back a number of times, and then came to England in 1947, and went to school and became acculturated uh, as an Englishman. Uh, through long training and later when I decided to change to a certain extent from history which I'd done at university to study anthropology I went to see the leading expert on Nepal and India who was a man called Christoph von Führer Heimendorf and said I wanted to go back to where I'd been brought up in the Garo Khasi hills in Assam and he, he was unable to get me in because there was a, a war going on, the Naga resistance. And so he said, my dear, would you like to go to Nepal? So I said, where is Nepal? And he showed me it's on a map. I said, where? And he said, well, the Gurungs are a very nice people because I visited them several times. And there was a young French anthropologist called Pignet who worked there and wrote a book about them, but he sadly died. And so there's still lots of work to do. So for my doctorate thesis in anthropology, I went to study in Tak, a village north of Pukra. And it was then very remote. It took a long time to get from here. You had to stop at various places like Athens before you could get there. 
when you got there, of course, Kathmandu was um, a very small town. And as for Pokhara, there was no road to Pokhara at that time. The only wheels in Pokhara were the plain wheels. Uh, I think they were, they'd somehow carried in five taxis. And um, there were three hotels with all the same food, which was dal bato. Um, and so off we set to, to Pokhara and tra walked and walked and found this village perched on the top of a, a ridge, as Gurung villages are. And the field work for 15 months was very difficult in many ways. I was very homesick, it was very tough, but I came to really admire and love the people we were with. And so some 15 years later, when I'd remarried, and our children are old enough. My wife and I visit, revisited um, the village and she absolutely loved it. Said she wouldn't leave unless I promised her a return ticket, which I did. And so we went back almost every year for about 15 years um, from 1986 until the Maoist movement in 2003. And since then, we've been back about three times. So I've been 20 times to talk. And this is a period of over 50 years. And I've filmed and and some, I am adopted into a Gurung family. So I have a, sisters and, and nephews and nieces. My parents have died. But um, I feel somewhat Gurung. I don't speak the language very well, but a bit. And I really loved that experience. So my life is entangled, although I'm sitting here in Cambridge as a Cambridge academic. Um, part of my heart and mind is in Nepal. defining factors that are uniquely prevalent in the Gurung compared to the rest of Nepalese? Well, Nepal is split in two. The northern half is tibeto burman peoples who've come down from Tibet and China. And so the Gurungs are part of that. There are many other, the Rais, the Limbus, the Magas, and the Gurungs. So the Gurungs are not really very different um, from the Tamangs and all these other groups. In fact, they call themselves the Tamume, which is a similar route to the Tamangs. And so 80-90% overlap between all these groups along the Annapurna and central higher mountains of Nepal. And then the southern half of uh, Nepal has been mainly populated up from India. So there's Indo-Aryan people. So the people in the north have a mixture of shamanic and um, Buddhist religions 
and the people from the south are mainly Hindus. Um, so they're not particularly different from other martial, as they are called martial races, um, though they do have one or two special features, which I can tell you about if you want. Well, I think all the groups came into Nepal from slightly different areas. So there's a kind of cousinly similarity with the Magars and the Tamangs, but they probably came in slightly different routes, coming in from the east, probably from China, all of them, and certainly the Gurungs. And the Gurungs' routes into Nepal uh, are now through DNA and the work of my former student, Dr. Tech Gurung, they're now established as having come down from northern China, from Coconut Lake, down through China for quite a long time. So their DNA has Mongolian, Chinese, um, uh, ethnic minority groups, Nashi, and then Tibetan, and then down into... And um, because of this, they've preserved their uh, tribal identity very, very well, very strongly. That's a big group, and they're very proud of their history, and they have preserved their myths and rituals, which I've studied, better than any other group in the Himalayas. I've looked at all the groups along the western side of China, for example, or Burma, or those all the other groups um, of a similar kind, the Nagas and so on. There's nowhere where there is such a rich folklore and um, mythology as among the Gurungs. So, for some reason or other, they are extremely important ethnic minority within Nepal. Um, you've said how they have very distinct uh, myths. Could you tell me more about that? Well, the myths are not um, false things. Many people say, oh, it's just a myth. A myth, um, anthropologists think, is a, a kind of history when you don't have writing, and the Gurungs didn't, didn't have writing. So it is a set of stories which contain deeper truths. They contain truths which you find, for example, in the Christian Bible about the origin of species. I mean, the Gurung myths t tell the stories of how first man and the first women, um, and how the progress and the, our relations with animals and our place in the world. So they, they fill out the whole cosmology and they are central to um, the religion of the Gurungs because um, just as we sing hymns with words and so on in the West, when you are doing a ritual, and they have fantastic rituals.
I've filmed a lot of them. I've got the best film materials on early Gurung rituals in the world because hardly anyone else filmed them. So I have film of about 30 or 40 of their important rituals. And while they're um, telling their stories, while they're doing the ritual, they have to tell the story. So that each ritual has a number of these myths attached to it. And some of the rituals go on for hours. The most important, which is a three-day Pue Lava, which is the funeral ritual, takes the spirit of the dead person from the village. And the fascinating thing was that I recorded all this and it takes him from the village to a higher village and then a higher village and then up into Manang, Mustang, Tibet, China, right up to Lake Kokonor. And of course you couldn't prove that that's the route of the Gurungs down to their village. Now with DNA we've, Tech has shown this is the case. So the, the myths have to be learned off by heart by the Pochu, as they're called, which is a traditional priest of the Gurungs. And what is fascinating is that not only do they have this incredibly rich, important ritual and mythical world, uh, Peda Luda, as it's called, Pues, uh, the myths, and the Lu is the rituals, but they also incorporate Buddhism. So they have another set of priests, um, Klevri, they're called, who probably were from Tibet and picked up on the way. So they do some of the funeral rituals and they have ancestor rites. So the, every house has ancestors in it. You know, you throw a little bit of food to the your ancestors in the fire and you worship them in certain times of year. But they also have, they are Buddhist as well. They're usually thought of as Buddhist. Buddhism is only one of the many rituals or beliefs they have. So that some people, the certain groups within the Gurungs have Buddhist funerals. Um, and they're also Hindus. They're quite happy to have little Hindu godlings scattered around the village. So simultaneously, they are many different religious traditions all together.
So when they migrated, they were a very small uh, yeah. group of people. And in a Nepali society, how have they coexisted um, as, as they are a very small ethnic minority? Well, they're, they're about, I suppose, must be over half, half a million now, Gurungs, 500,000. Um, I think part of the early explanation is that they were in a rather remote area. They were, they came down from mountains, down from Tibet, and they've always liked living on the top of mountains. And when Rishvi Narayan Shah united in Nepal, he used Gur Gurkha troops, the Gurungs. Gurkha is the Western term for them. and. At that time, they were quite warlike. They lived in sort of fortified, they had little castles on the top of hills, and no one would think about attacking them because they defended themselves very strongly. So there was no threat of being um, assimilated or even attacked by a majority. But Nepal was much less populated then, and so there were the towns lower down were small. So they lived coexisted perfectly well then. And they have coexisted since, um, not through killing anyone who attacked them, but um, just because they are in that area and, and they tend to dominate, they're very capable in whatever they're doing and so no one would overtake them. So Pokhara is mainly a Gurung city and that's the second largest city of Nepal. and. Um, they they get on very well with other people. I'll talk about that more. So n no one feels like getting rid of the gurungs. They they, they coexist perfectly friend in a perfectly friendly way, um, and they're not a above marrying into other groups or other groups marrying into the gurungs. They're a clean caste. That is, you know, they were accepted. Um, gurung couldn't eat in a Brahmin house, but a Brahmin would possibly eat in a Gurung house. So they are above the level of the unclean castes. And so they intermarried with other groups and also there's a lot of intermarriage which is often concealed between them and the Magas and Tamang. So if you trace ancestry you find that many of the Gurungs and also uh, with the Dalits. I, I had discovered very late on that my own family had been married at, once or twice into Dalit. But then you, you know, cover it over or whatever. So they're they're very um, capable of getting on with uh, 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 with anyone, and that's why they're also very successful in the West and get on with anyone. So it's their ability to adapt. Yes, this this is their, one of their strongest characteristics. They're incredibly adaptable. Um, if you think of their long history, they start as fishermen on the lake in northern China. They then go down to western China and probably do a little bit of agriculture and a little bit of keeping of animals. And then they go to Tibet and they become shepherds for some hundreds of years. And then they come down three, four hundred years ago 
the top of these mountains and they start becoming um, what are called Swidden cultivators. They cut down the forests and they grow maize and millet and things. And then they go a bit lower and they become rice farmers and then they go down into the cities and they become successful uh, in city life and now most of them are outside the, the hills, they're in Hong Kong or London or wherever it is. And so at each stage, what is miraculous about them is that at each stage they totally change their mode of living, uh, their, how they earn their living and how they interact and what kind of houses and things like that. They remain gurus. There's something quintessential. So when I visit my gurum friends in London, I'm in a gurum house. We eat with our hands. We have the gurum um, ancestor shrine on the wall. I know they do gurum rituals. They believe in witches, um, as they do in the village. They speak in gurum. And I put it down a lot to the child rearing, which is very strong, but very warm. They're very, very good with children. They're very kind and loving parents. And the children, there's no tension between the generations. So the children grow up like their parents as gurungs. And even if they're sent to British schools and speak English as a maybe a maiden language, they hold on to this gurungness. So when I go to gurung reunions in London, and there are thousands of them around Basingstoke and so on, um, it feels as if I'm in a Gurung town, you know, they all speak and um, the interactions, those, those little sort of interpersonal reactions, the body distances, the gestures, the warmth, all that is what I have met in villages in Nepal. Um, so earlier on you talked um, about the about how gurus were once fishermen, hmm. um, they then became farm herders, hmm. um, shepherds. Um, from the historical per uh, perception to now, what, how has the occupation sort of changed? How have they economically, f from your observation, um, what, how do you find the changes? Well, the, the important thing for, you, for your readers to understand is the great transition that occurred in the first half of the 19th century because they had been famous as soldiers in Prithni Narayan's armies because um, they were um, shepherds. Shepherds had to be fairly warlike because uh, traditionally, you know, it's very easy to steal other people's sheep and there are lots of wild animals and so on. So the, the Gurungs had quite a lot of weapons. They weren't an aggressive people, but they defended themselves. And so when um, when the British started to expand northwards, uh, the British Empire, as you know, it just it always had a frontier of often fairly warlike peoples in Assam, it was the Nagas, and um, in Af on the Afghan border, it was the Afghans and so on and so on. Um, and they encountered, in the early 19th century, they'd pushed up into the Punjab, into uh, Bihar and so on. And there, were th there was these mountains with these people on it. And they made, there, were, there was an attempt to try and as they sometimes did, to actually incorporate this into um, the British Empire. And they met the hill peoples and they were defeated, pushed out. Um, and um, they realized then that they'd met people who were extremely good hill warriors. And in the famous report on why the British should recruit the, the, these people into the British Army by Hodgson um, he, in the 1830s or 40s, he was a British resident in Kathmandu later. He said, these are the people we need in our army because not only are they 
extraordinarily tough. You know, they spend their lives walking up and down mountains, so they, they can walk anywhere with very heavy loads on their backs. Physically, they're perfect. Um, temperamentally, they're perfect. They're extraordinarily good at um, receiving orders. They obey very well, but they can also lead and command if needed. So they're very di well disciplined. They work extraordinarily well together. They're very cooperative and work as a team. They don't have a caste system, so you don't have the problem with the Indian troops that you know you can't feed them less than that and so on. They're very egalitarian, both in their social relations with each other, but also men and women. Um, they've got a great sense of humor. They like football. Well, they probably would like football, uh, sport, uh, uh, games playing people. So in their temperament and physique and everything, they are the people you should recruit. Now, what they're not unique in general because um, it's a feature of the British Empire and all the empires that they find their soldiers in mountains, the, the great sort of mer mercenary or um, troops of Europe were from Switzerland. The Italians, the French, everyone took troops from Switzerland. The British took them from my ancestral home, Scotland. The Scottish regiments. And that's for two reasons. One is that they are very strong and hardy. Also, they are quite warlike, again, in Scotland, because they have to defend their herds. And the second reason is that they need the employment. In shepherding doesn't require, I mean, one person can look after a lot of sheep. And so you have a problem of underemployment or unemployment in mountain areas. It produces too many people, particularly young men. And so these mountain areas, whether it's the Alps or the Himalayas or wherever, produce surplus young men who are ideally adapted to going into the army. So from the 18... 40s, the British started to recruit these people because the British Empire was founded on um, having a very small number of British troops and very and administrators running this vast empire. The only way you could do it was to lo use the local people, both to run the lower levels of the administration and also to police the empire. So the, the Gurkhas were used to fight other groups who were fighting the British Empire, for example, in Assam, there were Gurkha regiments or against the Japanese or whatever. And so for a hundred years or so, they were really central part of the British Empire armies in the entirely dependable they, during the um, Indian uh, rebellion or whatever you like to call it, they, they didn't desert the British and they fought valiantly, and they have higher numbers of, as you know, military crosses and, and uh, Victoria crosses and almost other, they're wonderful troops. Um, but one f assumption and fallacy about them is that they're aggressive. Having lived in a Gurung village for three years of my life, I suppose, adding up all my visits, I've never seen it, any aggression. I mean, I suppose once or twice uh, uh, someone who is drunk has, has sort of kicked a dog or something. But they're very calm and gentle with their children, with their, uh, across the genders, they don't beat any. So I, they're peaceful and I've seen them sort of run uh, screaming with half uh, simulated fear when a small buffalo comes down the village street. I mean, so th they're calm, peaceful and loving people in their villages. But if they're trained and if they're given an order, then they carry it out. And as a result, they're quite feared and said that the Argentinians gave up when they heard the Gurkhas were coming. <laughs>
opportunistics mm. of grooms. Um, and, but are these characteristics, what makes it so distinct compared to other Nepalis that they have been? Uh, how, how do they make, make some what? How are they, how are these characteristics so distinct from other Nepalis? Um, well, it's not the the groups that were recruited into the Gurkhas are all this group along the northern uh, mountains. So they're not distinct from the Magals or the Rise Limbus. They're distinct from the southern half of Nepal, mainly because that's much more. It's um, got a, the caste system, and so it's more hierarchical. The gender relations also are different. Um, I only know it really through what I've observed in Tak, and there it's very mild form because the the hill Brahmins and the hill uh, Dalits are you know have lost or been incorporated to a lot a large extent into Gurung life, but still there and certainly in Pokhara, you know the women walk behind the men a long distance up behind. They're much more deferential to the men. Um, there are purity and caste traditions, um, and so the in terms of the absolute equality, which is very helpful if you're training an army, where within the ranks there is no uh, tension between any of the groups. Um, I think it can be overdone. I mean. Uh, I've seen and heard about, I mean, increasingly a lot of people who turned up at the Gurkha recruitment places saying they were Gurungs were actually not, I mean, were Magars or Gurungs or something, weren't. And probably if you ask the officers, they, they couldn't tell the difference as soldiers. They became extremely good as soldiers and they were pretty tough as well. So it was a, a slight edge that they had, but for a long time the British tried to ensure that it was these mountain people who they were recruiting. And of course during that time there were no documentation. Sorry? During this time there were no documentation, so it would be difficult. No, it was very difficult to prove. I mean, it's the same with the British army um, in that uh, during the war, many people thought, well, the, uh, the Scots or the Welsh or um, Yorkshire people in their hills would make better troops. Um, but it's always astounding to find that the people who, for example, won the Battle of Kohima were from the home counties. They were stockbrokers from Kent and, you know, people who'd never seen a rifle or done a day's exercise in their life and they turn up from their banks and wherever it was and they fight very valiantly. So human beings are very malleable and capable if you put them in a different setting and give them some encouragement. Um, but the, the Gurungs, uh, there was this symbiosis between the Gurung officers, like some of my friends who are Gurung uh, or Gurkha officers, they became extremely friendly because of this warmth of the Gurungs. They're very loving, warm people. And so they incorporated their officers. They would call them, you know, older brother and and be very happy to sort of drink with them and so on. And many uh, Gurkha officers re remember with enormous fondness, not least that their lives had often been saved. I have close associations because, I mean, because two of my mother's brothers were Gurkhas um, and both of them fought in uh, Burma. One was in the Chindits, the famous regiment which, which went behind the Japanese lines and another was in the Six Gurkhas. And my father recruited uh, the Assam rifles during the Second World War and he, uh, he was also, he had many Gurkhas in his regiment. Yes, I'm first and second Assam rifles. So my life has been surrounded. And I, I have this theory that I was imprinted with the love of the, the, the Gurungs because when I was a child, when I was born, the first face I probably saw was a, 
um, Himalayan hill woman's face. You know, the ayahs were Garos and Kasis and others. So when I looked up, the first face I saw had a Mongolian eyes. Since then, I've I've always found people from that area, Chinese as well as particularly attractive. I feel warmer and close to them. Um, so I like to think I'm bas- basically I have white skin. But, um, it's a soul. I'm the opposite of what one of my friends described himself. He's Malay. He described himself as a banana, yellow on the outside and white inside. I'm white on the outside and yellow inside. I don't know what that makes me. <laughs> You've studied gurus over so many years and yes. you have documented, documented a lot of changes. And I just want to understand about um, education um, and how the gurus view education and with reference to historically when they migrated, how has uh, this changed over time. Well, they, when I went to Tak, there was hardly any education for Gurungs. The only way was really through the army. The 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 village itself had no school. Uh, it was a village of you know some thousand or more people. And there was no school in it. You had to walk down um, a thousand, two thousand feet down to the village school. And so children of from the age of six or seven would have to walk right down and then right up every day to school. And it only got a school after I'd left in 1973 or 4, when some returning Guru, uh, Gurkhas built the school. And even through t- in the 80s, 90s, the school was a typical hill Nepali school. In other words, there was hardly any furniture, um, it was rote learning, it was Nepali textbooks, you weren't taught in Gurung or anything like that. But there were beginning to be good schools in Pokhara, so, uh, and the Gurungs were moving down from the hills. So if you were a returned Gurkha, you would probably wouldn't settle back in a village from the 90s onwards, you would settle down in Pokhara for the education, because the Gurungs, like many groups, highly value education. They see it as very important. And so uh, they make big sacrifices to send their school, uh, children to good schools, and there's some good, very good schools in Pokhara. And um, later to British schools. So they are like many people in Asia. They re- I mean, a- Asia values education, particularly from China, Eastwards values education more in many ways than people in the West. In the West, it's it was class education, and the upper classes went to certain schools and then to universities, and the rest left school quite early. And it wasn't seen as a a way to promote yourself. But in in much of Asia, it's highly uh, valued, and parents put it huge effort so I saw many families really struggling to save the money to send their children to schools.
time, I suppose, education has opened a lot of doors uh, mm. for the generations. Mm. Um, families who have recruited in Gurkhas, um, like you said, a, a value education, and so mm. probably push their you know, children mm. um, towards it. Um, but um, I think um, the other um, notion that I want to understand um, is the West views um, girls to be martial race and is this inherently true? Well, when you say the West, um, I, I'm afraid to say that if you walked along King's Parade here and you say Tell me what you think about the Gurungs, they'd say, who they, who they. Um, but it is true that um, a kind of a stereotype which you might have in the, in the media and among those who know about these things, um, it, it, rather than Gurungs, if you said Gurkhas, uh, people would say, oh yes, uh, they're the martial races. Um, it's true when, I mean, it's both half true and half false. It's, it's true in the sense that they chiefly became known in the West through being recruited into the British Army and the Indian Army. So, um, and many people who retired here had served with them and worked with them. So um, they were best known in the West through their service in the Army. Um, but then the stereotype from that, which terrified the Argentinians, which is that they are intrinsically some kind of sort of particularly ferocious is a, a myth that there's nothing particularly ferocious about them. If they're not in the army, they're as peaceful as anyone else, more so perhaps. And in their home villages, as I mentioned, they're not a martial race, but they are they're a martial race to the extent that the Highland Scots, my ancestors in Highland, are a martial race. There are people who, through a period of 200 years in the British Empire, became uh, particularly adapted to serving in armies. Um, and now they, that period is largely over and there are many less Gurkhas. And so they're no more martial. They have this reputation, of course, not just in the West, but also in India, because one of the occup traditional occupations of Gurkhas was to be security guards, for instance, in uh, India, because a man in a Gurkha uniform with his kukri and his belt was enough to deter the thieves who were going to raid your bank and so on. So they are quite widely, and they become security guards. One of my friends was a security guard to the Sultan of Brunei, his younger brother, and so on. So they are esteemed. And this is partly also the character thing. Um, there were security guards, I think, in India and some of my friends here, because they're terribly trustworthy. They're very loyal and it's very difficult to bribe them. Because once you've established a relationship of trust between yourself and someone else, as I know with my friends, it's very difficult to break. They're not opportunistic. You know, if someone comes along with a large bribe, asks them to let them into the bank, they wouldn't do it because they say, no, you know, we, we've, uh, this is our job, we've promised. And so their honourable nature, their trustworthiness, um, makes them extremely good uh, soldiers and, and security guards. So they, they have a, it's not surprising they have that reputation but it's no more, uh, it's not anything to do with fierceness. So this goes back to what you were saying about uh, how they adapt so well. Um, they can be ferocious if, they, mm. if the situation uh, needs them to be, um, but as a general, they're just a very soft... Uh, well, the, this, this is um, in my... I wrote a short book called The Guide to the Gurungs, with a Gurung friend, my uncle actually, Indra Bahadur, I.B. Gurung. And we wrote it together. And um, I think there, and certainly in my longer book on, on the Gurung's resources and population, um, 
I uh, say that the, the, the social structure of, which is basically Chinese, is one where you are very sensitive to other people. You pick up um, their feelings and their relations. So one of the things I really like about them and the Chinese is that they are very delicate in dealing with social relations. They they treat you with courtesy, respect. They they keep their distance. They don't push themselves. They don't. They're not too humble. They're just, and they do that. So they're very contextual. They had to be like that to a certain extent in their agriculture because a Gurung village later on when it's doing wet rice cultivation, you have to work extremely carefully and closely with people. So water trickles down through all the rice fields. You have to, so you have to be extremely good team players. Um, you know, you need to have some initiative, but not too much. So it's like I was taught football, you know, pass the ball when you have to pass the ball. So they are very, very good interactive in their rituals, in their social life, in their singing, in their dancing, in their agriculture. They work perfectly in harmony. They're like an orchestra. Now, many peoples are like that to a certain extent, but they are extremely good at that. And so that made them into very, very good soldiers because that's exactly what you need. You know, you're going through the jungle and someone, you have to be sensitive to that person there and that what's happening. And they're very, very good at that. And it's one of the things I really enjoyed and loved about being with Gurungs, that you could both trust them and that they picked up um, relationships very calmly and very sensitively. Thank you very much. Okay. I think that concludes all the questions.